our new president, whom I admire very much. President Jonathan Walton is a social ethicist who focuses on the evangelical church, how it interacts with mass media and political culture. He is the author of two books and too many articles and chapters to tell you about. Many, 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 many. If you go to jonathanlwalton.com, you can see the dozens and dozens and dozens of articles. He is husband to Cecily and the father of three. And I'm going to tell you, when I first got to see him in action, when I first began to be impressed with you, Jonathan, is when we were both in the PhD program at the same time. And I saw you in the library, not in a class. I was never lucky enough to have a seminar with him. But I saw him in the library, not the new Wright Library, not the almost as new loose library, but Spear Library. It was not hard to shine in Spear Library compared to the surroundings. But Jonathan, you shone in a really important way one day. I was walking through. I was walking through spear to go to Luce, and you were sitting um, on the way there, and you had a group of MDiv students gathered around you who just seemed to be hanging on your every word, and you seemed so eager to help shape them, help encourage them, help grow them into the leaders they could be, and I thought to myself, wow, that Jonathan Walton is one impressive guy. And then after graduation from the PhD program, he went to Harvard to become a professor and the minister of the chapel. And I thought, wow, that Jonathan Walton is one impressive guy. <laughs> he must be an amazing scholar and a fantastic preacher to have that role. I'm going to keep my eye on him and see what happens. And then he went from there to Wake Forest Divinity School to be the dean. And I thought, wow, that Jonathan Walton. <laughs> He is a great administrator, he must be, and a great leader, and I thought, wow, that Jonathan Walton would be a great president of a seminary one day. <laughs> and then um, I had the opportunity to serve alongside Jonathan on the Board of Trustees. I was your alumni trustee on the Board of Trustees, and so I got to see Jonathan in action on the board, and I remember, especially when we were talking about the, um, the name of the chapel, and how so many in the student body were somewhere between suggesting and demanding that the name be changed of the chapel. And the way you spoke into that was so insightful and so meaningful and showed such leadership, I thought to myself, that Jonathan Walton should be president of Princeton <laughs> Seminary someday. And so I was so pleased when the time came and they asked for people that we could nominate. And I nominated that Jonathan Walton along with dozens of other people, I'm sure. But I am so proud that the leader that I nominated, along with so many others, is here as our new president. He's been here through, since January 1st. Let's welcome him to this keynote. Wow, thank you so much for those really kind and generous words, Chip. Um, it's been a pleasure serving alongside of you uh, as we do the work of this amazing learning community together. You are an amazing partner, and you are such a wonderful steward of this community. And I'm thankful for you. And to all of you here gathered today, welcome home. It is so good to be back, and it is so good to see so many familiar faces, some faces that I uh, get to see regularly uh, through the years, and some faces that I have not seen in a few decades. But it is heartwarming to be able to connect, reconnect, and make new connections. That is one of the reasons I have to say that it feels so special for me to be in this role. I've had the privilege in my career of serving some amazing learning communities. 
I've had the privilege of being in leadership uh, at some top tier learning communities. And in, in those places, it's been an amazing experience. I've learned incredible lessons, valuable lessons. But I always had a sense of envy, if not jealousy, among, in relationship to many of my peers. Some of my peers at those institutions who served in leadership, who were on the faculty, who were in the administration, who were also alums of the institution. And so while we were out, and whether it was development work, engaging with alums, walking through campus, I would see the ways that they would respond, their body would respond to the built environment. I would hear them talk about, oh, well, when I was in school here, and or me and my spouse, or me and my partner, or oh, remember when we did such and such, or you remember when we got in trouble doing I watched the ways when they would have moments such as this at alumni gatherings, where they're, they would smile with their eyes, and you could see their heart beating through their chest. Because even if they couldn't remember a name, they would say, I remember you. That was an experience that I never had. Until now. <laughs> and I can't tell you how much it means to me to be able to serve an institution that's served me so well. To be able to be a part of a learning community and a part of an alumni network at an institution that literally changed my life and introduced me to friendships and relationships that I know that whenever the Lord calls me home, we'll all be together. And so I just want to extend those introductory words to let you know how honored I am to stand here as your eighth president. So this wasn't supposed to start like this. <laughs> Get my emotions under control. Wow. Um, my friends, I'm here to talk about, really, I'm here to talk about my vision and values and how I believe my vision and values and experience align with the incredible work that's happening here at Princeton Theological Seminary. Here to talk about how I think about tradition, how I think about innovation, and how this community has always, since 1812, typified both. And what it means to me to be here. As we think about what the next We've had 200 years, so what does the next 100 years look like? And what do we leave for the next generation? What steps do we take right now so that we are for subsequent generations what this place was to us? I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. I come from a religious tradition 
that regards education as sacred. Education is a sacred task. Education is the key to liberation. It unlocks the door of opportunity and the access gates of democracy. And it was local communities of faith between Raleigh, North Carolina and Atlanta, Georgia that modeled such lessons for me. I'm talking about loving, proud, and tender people. People who valued the life of the mind and the life of the spirit. So much so that the quest for literacy and learning were inextricably bound together and they were an expression and extension of one's faith. Consider my maternal grandfather, John Curtis Washington. John Curtis Washington, who actually turned 99 this Thursday. He was the former head of the Raleigh chapter of the NAACP, and he was the head of the steward board at St. Paul's African Methodist Episcopal Church in Raleigh on Edenton Street. Historian Sarah Thusen, she talks about him, and references his faith and his activism in her book, Greater Than Equal, African American Struggles for Citizenship in North Carolina. 1919 to 1965. She talks about him because following the Brown versus Board of Education ruling, it was my grandfather who would take my mother and my aunt to school board meetings each month where they would sit with him while he would make a public case to petition for their admission to the local school closest to their home. It was this that led them to be among the first cohort of students to integrate the public schools in Raleigh. And this, as Thusen writes, was not adjacent to his faith. This was actually animated by his faith. His faith and his activism were inextricably bound up together. And despite what society may say at any given moment, for me, it was progressive African-American Protestant communities of faith coupled with my undergraduate education at Morehouse College. I see my dear Morehouse brother back there, class of 1969. <laughs> it was there at Morehouse that imbued in me a sense of what another Morehouse graduate theologian Howard Thurman called a sense of somebodiness. They taught that faith, faith plus education equals activism. If you want to change the world, read. If you want to have a positive impact, learn. As my grandfather would often tell us, don't spend your time getting mad at water for being wet. <laughs> learn how to swim. For fleecy locks and dark complexion, cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black, white, red, white, brown, all the same. If I were as tall as to reach a pole or grab the ocean at a span, I must be measured by my soul. Why? Because the mind remains the standard of a man and a woman. Learn, read. This is an extension and an expression of your faith and the fact that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the imago dei, the image of God. Faith and intellect, what the Greeks called paideia and piety spiritual and intellectual cultivation, a well-rounded individual that celebrates intellectual honesty and epistemic humility. Intellectual honesty and epistemic humility insofar as we are all aware that virtue and vanity are the dual engines that catalyze all of us through the world. And we always must keep track of both. as the towering 
sociologist and former president of Morehouse College, Benjamin Elijah Mays, used to say, uh, he put it this way, whatever you do, do it so well that people looking on you will feel that the task was reserved especially for you by God. Whatever you do in life, you do it so well that people will say, that task was reserved for you by God. It's a different play on the priesthood of all believers. But it's a consistent with this sense of a capacious sense of God's call. A capacious sense of God's call. And I have to say, it's this capacious sense of God's call that was an ideal that Princeton Seminary affirmed, affirmed and enhanced for me during my time here. Oh, during my student days, though I was licensed to the ministry as a senior at Morehouse College and I worked it for a congregation right out of undergraduate, Princeton Seminary proved a haven to wrestle with my expanding sense of vocation. My expanding sense of vocation is another way of just saying, I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> but it was having the space and having intellectual and spiritual mentors here at Princeton Seminary uh, that helped me to make peace with the fact that pastoral ministry wasn't for me. I, pastoral ministry, that wasn't the path for me. I was surrounded by classmates. I was surrounded by amazing people. I'm looking at some of you in this room. Eustacia Moffitt Marshall, Carla Jones, looking at some of you that I knew the church would be in great hands. But it was here under the tutelage of people like Nancy Duff, Geddes Hansen, Peter Paris, that they offered an alternative and an expanded vision of ministry. My commitment to truth, justice, and mercy could occur primarily behind a podium, not a pulpit, in a classroom, not a congregation. But yet, Chip, yet, Larry, we, at no point did we ever think that we weren't engaged in ministry. Maintaining this capacious sense of God's call. And it's this, mate, this capacious sense of God's call. Sorry about this. Here we go. Let's get back on that. Where was I? I guess it's saying you're running your mouth too much between slides. <laughs> But it's this capacious sense of God's call that actually continues to inform my work as a theological educator. It's a core value that's been important for me, both in the classroom and one that has led university churches. Helping people of faith identify how they might live out their call and support Christ's church in all fields of human endeavor. For example, during my decade at Harvard, there was a saying among some students. There was a saying among students at Harvard that basically you've got five career options. You could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, you could be a consultant, you could be in high finance, or you can be a loser. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> and thus it was there that I really saw it as my mission to impress upon students, whether they were in religious studies or not, that it's not about how one makes a living. The more important question is whether we find a cause greater than ourselves to make life worth living. Meaning and purpose are at the heart of eudaimonia, a good life. And this became the aim of my second book, 
a lens of love, reading the Bible in its world for our world. The book grew from a Bible study that I led for young professionals and graduate students in the Cambridge area. <clears throat> because so many had expressed frustration and insecurity about incorporating their faith into all aspects of their lives. Too many of these young professionals felt that they had to bracket off their faith, including their ethical engagement with the Bible, lest they come across as unscientific or, or unlearned or even socially regressive, particularly when it came to matters such as gender, race, or sexuality. That's why this book actually was not written for those who were called to traditional ministry, per se. It was written for those who wanted the tools of theological education to apply as they became more faithful lawyers, physicians, engineers, church elders, and deacons. Uh, to be sure, unlike many university-based divinity schools, Princeton Seminary remains well equipped to prepare postulants for ordination. We have a rich and enduring tradition of training pastors and professors in the theological guild. We do that so well, absolutely. But there's something else about Princeton Seminary. We've also trained those who have put their competencies to work as educators, as journalists, as lawyers, as military officers, elected officials, all fields of human endeavor. Oh, when I think about, when I think about people like Elijah Paris Lovejoy, Elijah Parrish Lovejoy, a great journalist and abolitionist. There's a plaque in front of Mackay that says, he died defending the freedom of the press. Okay. That's a way to put it. He died at the hands of a white supremacist mob defending his abolitionist newspaper. graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. Or Prathia Hall. Prathia Hall, great minister and preacher out of that incredible city of brotherly love known as Philadelphia. I think we have some Philadelphia people here. <laughs> Prathia Hall, who earned her both her master's and her PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary, leader in the civil rights movement as a young girl, as a young girl, and I'm saying girl in terms of teenager, leading the Albany movement. It's she who was leading the community and congregation assembled in prayer when the Lord showed up. The Lord, I'm not talking about God, that was their condescending name that they used to refer to Martin Luther King Jr. as, student activists. When he would show up after they've been working and when established quote unquote civil rights leaders would show up, they would often say, uh-oh, here come the Lord. <laughs> but it was when the Lord showed up, Martin Luther King Jr., and he heard her praying, and it was Prathia Hall who was praying in her prayer with the refrain, I have a dream. And she kept saying, I have a dream over and over again. And being the gifted communicator and intellectual interlocutor and generous borrower, <laughs> <laughs> Martin Luther King began to take that refrain on the road to close out his sermons, which ended up culminating in one of the most famous speeches of world history on the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Or oh, William Gray or David Bratt in the halls of Congress. Bert Ehrman, incredible scholar down at the University of North Carolina Darnell Moore, executive with Netflix, 
Elizabeth Diaz, writer for the New York Times, or Margaret Kibben, current chaplain to the House of Representatives. Princeton Seminary alums flourishing in all fields of human endeavor, answering God's call in a myriad of ways. And I am here to say that they provide us with examples because meeting the needs of expanding cohorts of learners is essential for the future of theological education. Our future depends upon it. We must speak to the intellectual and spiritual passions of today's learners. We all know congregational ministry, particularly congregational ministry traditionally conceived, is not necessarily a growth industry at the moment. <laughs> we have witnessed decade over decade decline in religious affiliation. And those who identify as the nuns have grown within each generation. That's an important point, that nuns have grown within each generation. We like to say that nuns have grown with each generation, right? So in other words, subsequent generations, they're growing. No, well, that is true, the number of them. But they're also growing within each generation. There are more non-baby boomers now this decade than there were last decade. More non-Gen Xers this decade than there were last decade. There are even more none of the silent generation this decade than there were in previous decades. This says something. This says something. Because Though there are nuns, we also know that when it comes to matters of faith, ultimate values, and ultimate concerns, even when people are choosing not to affiliate with a congregation or a particular religious tradition, that does not mean that faith, values, ultimate concern are no longer relevant because two-thirds of those who identify as nuns still actually express a belief in God. So what we see regarding religious attendance reflects actually more significant trends. It's the decline of face-to-face -face community interactions. It's disaffiliation that's happening across the board. Social scientists like Robert Putnam identified this at the end of the previous century. Advanced media technologies, declining civic trust in institutions, and most recently, the pandemic have only exacerbated these trends. And that religious participation is one of the few bastions of accessible civic engagement, bonding social capital, and thus overall community well-being. That has to be a cause for alarm for us. We can't ignore the double bind that disaffiliation creates. Particularly for traditional religious professionals, our students, our graduates, you in this room. Decreased religious affiliation, decreased religious attendance, that translates into decreased wages, fewer employment opportunities, diminished resources for our congregations. We all know this to be true. Nevertheless, the evidence also shows that decreased civic engagement and disaffiliation also contributes to higher rates of loneliness, depression, and diseases and deaths of despair such as addiction. So in other words, as resources for our communities of faith are in decline. The need for our communities of faith and faith leaders like you are on the increase. And so it's this double bind that speaks to the need that clearly we have to do something differently. We need a multifaceted approach. 
Maybe this explains why healthcare professionals, educators, and even business professionals are increasingly seeking the competencies that we provide in theological education. Or, as varying industries demonstrate increased interest and concern for social ethics, equity, and matters of inclusion, some are realizing the importance of religious literacy and taking people's faith seriously. As an example, in January, I participated in a J-term class at Harvard Business School entitled The Spirituality of Leaders, Linking Spiritual Health and Leadership. The course at Harvard Business School, by the way, not Harvard Divinity School, at Harvard Business School. It brings together students from across the campus in January to reflect on the place of moral and spiritual formation in the lives of those who lead organizations. The course operates from the premise. It operates from the premise that Ethics can be taught, but it also must be shaped. What did we learn, Professor Stratton, from Peter Paris in our Aristotle course? Reading Nikhil McKeon Ethics. Virtue is learned through living virtuously in community with each other. Community is where our habits are formed. It's through the process of habituation, not just knowing what to do, but actually doing it, that we go from intellectual virtue to moral virtue or character. The course is co-taught by Dr. Howard Coe. Howard Coe is the former Assistant Secretary for Health in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under the Obama administration. He's currently the director of, Harvard, uh, of Harvard's initiative on health, spirituality, and religion based out of the T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And his initiative employs empirical research to promote an integrated model of spirituality, public health, and patient care. In the same way that ethics cannot be learned in isolation from community, physical and emotional and public health cannot be separated from enduring and ultimate values that bind communities together. I know that there's some of you in this room that specialize in this type of work. I see you. I see you, Abigail Evans. It's communities that bind us together where our habits are formed and where our health for good and for ill is engendered. This is the work that's coming out. like the term, Latin term relegare, where we get religion. It's about uniting, it's about binding, it's about being in relationship with one another. Similarly, in the fall, this past fall, Dan O'Day, who's the CEO of Gilead Sciences, he, a California-based pharmaceutical company, he invited me to address their 15,000 employees. Me, a theologian, a social ethicist. Why did he invite me to uh, speak at Gilead Day for 15,000 scientists and public health professionals? Well, because at my previous institution, we received over $7 million in funding to establish a faith coordinating center as part of their, Gilead's, COMPASS initiative. COMPASS, combating commitment to partnering in addressing HIV and AIDS in the southern states. A disease that is treatable, yet continues to ravage vulnerable populations, particularly in the southern region. For instance, though just 13% of the American population are African Americans, African Americans continue to constitute over 40% of all new cases each year with a disproportionate number of those in the southern region. 
this treatable disease. But now companies are understanding that it's clear that we cannot merely prescribe or medicate the problem away. But rather, companies like Gilead must address social determinants such as mistrust, racial stigma, and conspiracies of silence born of religious shame, gender-based violence, and homophobia in order to undertake holistic healing. Thus, they're beginning to learn what theologians have known since antiquity. And that is disease is physical, but illness, like a woman with the issue of blood, is social. And so, just as those in the fields of health must engage with local community organizations, including communities of faith, to shape and inform individual behaviors. This is how we have to start thinking about what we do in theological education. At Princeton Seminary, we have the competencies. I put this here. This is actually after that appearance. Somebody sent me this. I haven't seen this, but this is in the airport in Montreal. <laughs> A little embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> But, yeah, so y'all, I, I, I gave you this ammunition. You could pick at me about this. <laughs> but we are, we are equipped, and we have the competencies and the capacities to be a convening space for such important conversations here on this campus and off of the campus. We have much to offer professionals who desire to live out their faith in service beyond the walls of the church house or beyond the walls even of this beautiful campus. To do so, however, our institution must privilege flexibility and accessibility, and we must begin to take more student-centered approaches to learning. My friends, there is no need to limit our offerings to those who are willing or able to uproot their lives for an extended period of time like so many of us did. Modern technologies and learner-centered pedagogies enable us to offer more accessible and flexible learning options to broader pools of learners. I'll give you an example. I've spent the last dozen years at two institutions that aren't necessarily known for their accessibility. Harvard University and Wake Forest University. Ironically, both of these institutions exposed me to models of flexible and accessible engagement with, quote unquote, non-traditional learners that took student-centered approaches. At Harvard, it was through the Harvard Extension School. Has anybody heard of the Extension School? The Harvard Extension School is a school on campus. It's a school on campus. It's a division of continuing education. And they offer single courses. They offer professional certificates. They offer online and, and hybrid and in-person course offerings to both undergraduates and graduates. I would regularly host their graduations, their commencement services in the Memorial Church. And here one would witness longtime Harvard employees, working adults, those who had dropped out of college decades ago, and many who were first in their family to attend school. They would march across that platform and they would receive their stoles. And I have to tell you, rarely did I ever see graduates with more joy, excitement, and appreciation for the institution than I witnessed in these precious people. The Harvard Extension School. Flexibility and accessibility. This was one of the reasons that when I got to Wake Forest, I was so thrilled to spend the last couple of years helping them to establish a school of professional studies, not in Winston-Salem, but in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
the School of Professional Studies there and with a grant from the Lilly Endowment at the Divinity School, we actually developed two fully online graduate certificates through the School of Professional Studies. The first certificate was in faith and health equity, which launched in the spring. And the second certificate was in faith and ethical leadership. And these were both fully online asynchronous certificate options for an expanded pool of learners. I'm sharing these with you because these examples are not unique to Harvard or Wake Forest, but rather they represent a growing trend in higher education. It's not just the church that's changing due to decreased attendance and affiliation. The landscape of higher education is changing. Nationwide last spring, there was a year-to-year -year drop in undergraduate enrollment of 5%. Now somebody's gonna say, oh, well that's had to do, that's the impact of the pandemic. Nope. Enrollment has been on the decline since 2010 across the country. And when we factor in the demographic cliff, has anybody heard that term before, demographic cliff? Demographic cliff represents children who were born during the Great Recession when there was a drop. Well, it's time for them to go to college in 2025. And because of that demographic drop, they are anticipating an increased 15% decline in undergraduate enrollment beginning in just two years. This is why many in higher education feel that what we used to describe as quote unquote non-traditional learners or non-traditional students or second career students, that's a term we've used here a lot, third career students, Guess what? You know what we're going to call them now? <laughs> Students. <laughs> Learners. Learners. It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter what your other career options have been. Providing learners the opportunities to re-equip themselves, to retool, to re-engage, to fulfill and quench intellectual thirst. That's the future of higher education. And this is the reason that so many major institutions of higher ed are offering certificates and micro-credentials to engage diverse populations of learners. And we aren't talking about institutions that are vulnerable. We're talking about schools like Harvard. Wake Forest, NYU, Stanford, Brown University, Northwestern. I could keep going on and on, but all of these institutions have either started, like Columbia Universities, schools of professional studies or extension schools that are providing certificates and micro-credentials and degrees through flexible and accessible learning options because they are trying to skate to where the puck is going. These aren't institutions that are vulnerable right now. These are institutions with the highest level of brand reputation and acclaim, but they understand that if they are going to live out their mission, just like we have to understand, if we're gonna live out our mission, then we have to live out our mission in a way that speaks to learners where they are, who they are, not what we did, who they were. The good news is, though, that's our tradition. That's the innovation we have to make, but that's also our tradition. We have been long recognized here at Princeton Theological Seminary for our continuing education programs. Even if those continuing education programs, yes, they tended to cater to a particular demographic and a particular group and a particular profession in a particular way of folk who looked particular kind of ways and had a particular height. 
We can acknowledge that. But we also know the great work that's been happening. The great work that's been happening. I look at Dale Gillespie Rounds sitting up at the top of the room. The ways that she's began expanding and increasing what our offerings look like. Uh, when I think about the Institute of Youth Ministry, when I think about conferences and offerings hosted by our academic centers, the BART Center, the Black Theology and Leadership Institute, led by the Betsy Stockton Center for Black Church Studies, Hispanic Theological Institute. These are just a few examples, and we can expand this number exponentially with a coordinated effort between our Office of Advancement, alumni engagement, and better alignment and integration of the curricular and co-curricular learning options that we provide here at Princeton Theological Seminary. We have to shift our educational model to reflect the demands of a digitally enhanced world and a student-centered environment. We are making the investment. We are making the investment. I'll leave you with this. And I'd like to thank Lindsay for her extraordinary artistry and help on this. But this is a profile of one of our upcoming graduates this year, 2023. But this is an example of how we can no longer think about admissions, recruitment, student life, alumni engagement, as disparate and is in silos. Our greatest group of learners out there right now are the 11,000 alums that have passed through this campus. Our greatest offerings and those who will take advantage of the incredible things that we offer in person here will be people and learners who come through us through different vehicles, not necessarily being sent from their local presbytery. Here's one example. Wait, I wanna make sure we can. Can you hear this? So our program was set up, it was a hybrid program. So we were online and there were lectures that were um, pre-filmed. There were also like live lectures where we could interact with professors or um, speakers. There was a cohort of students who are still some of my very best friends. And then there was a lot of independent work. A lot of our work is asynchronous. So it worked with being a youth minister, which is more than full time. <laughs> Twice a year, we got to come here and meet the professors that we had seen online and go to the chapel and meet our cohort in person, which really just deepened those relationships. It was, it was so good. Without the chance to do the certificate in youth and theology online and continue to work full time, I never would have had the opportunity or the courage to apply to seminary. A capacious sense of God's call. Flexibility and accessibility. Digitally enhanced learning environment. This is who we must be for the next generation. This is who we need to be for you. 
I'd love to take any questions that you may have. Yes, right down here in the front. Okay, uh, Peter Bauer, uh, United Church of Christ, uh, San Antonio. As I mentioned with you last night, uh, Dr. Walton, we're seeing a precipitous drop in membership within denominations across the country over decades now. The United Church of Christ, for example, has dropped from 1.5 million uh, as of a, in the 1970s to about 770,000 right now. Oh, we've, have, we've seen the same trend with the Presbyterian Church USA, other denominations as well. We're looking at the whole thing, schism that's going on with the Methodist Church as we speak. Uh, what can we do to apply what you're talking about to uh, denominational structures in order to think in new ways, in prophetic ways, about being able to do effective ministry if it would include possible mergers, possible greater systems? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I um, especially with denominational leaders in this room. My father always taught me the mark of an intelligent man is to know his limitations. <laughs> and so I know where I can stay in my lane as it relates to theological education, institutions of higher learning, and not start doling out advice into other areas of which I don't have similar competencies. Though what I can say is, I think it's a similar approach as it relates to how denominations and congregations think about themselves and where they place their energy. For the most part, what we see right now happening was predicted decades ago by most social scientists as it relates to a post-denominational climate and post-denominational America. And even as we started seeing congregational growth, many of those congregations were disaffiliating from their denominations based upon what they felt to be certain restrictions and encumbrances upon them. Um, again, for good or for ill. So I think that just like institutions of the theological education, we have to stop, in my view, obsessing over what we're losing and turn our focus to the opportunities and the needs that are ahead of us. And so I'm less concerned about attendance as it relates to how do we get people back into the doors. And I'm more in, interested in, well, how can we use our resources to make an impact to combat diseases of despair, alienation, anxiety, high rates of depression, alcoholism and addiction? These, these are the sorts of things. And I think that in the same way, if denominations were to take and leverage their incredible resources and imaginations and intellects that they have access to and begin directing it toward those ways, I think that we could you know, make some uh, progress here. Do you have good news for those of us like myself who have had to oversee church closures? It depends on what it needed to be open for. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It depended on what it needed to be open for. Right. Yeah. 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 The reason why I asked that question. Excuse me, we're going to go up to. Yes. Oh, I'm going to. Yes. Okay. The, uh, um, Joy Abdul Mohan yes. from the Presbyterian Church of Trinidad go, has a question which says the migrant population is increasing in the global north. How is PTS's training of church leaders in this era facilitating mission rebound or mission reverse? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In incredible question. And actually, thank you for those who are tuning in with us uh, uh, remotely 
Uh, I appreciate you being here with us today. And this actually represents, again, how we're able to engage learners no matter where they are. They don't have to be on this physical campus. And, and I would say, um, in response to that, we do incredible thing, we're doing incredible things on this campus. The conversations that we're having, like the World Christianity Conference that, right, that was dealing with issues of migration, that was dealing with issues of pandemic, right, global sustainability, right, bringing thought leaders together. We can be that kind of convening space. But I'm glad that question was asked because you may have noticed at one point when I talked about us being a convening space, I said we could be a convening space or not. Do you recall that? And the reason I said or not was because it's actually about an epistemic shift, right? It's an epistemic shift. So rather than working from what some would describe as a colonial or even neo-colonial framework, as if we are the arbiters of knowledge, and therefore people throughout the world come to us and we dispense wisdom. No, it's also that we have the resources to empower and privilege those throughout the globe who are actually working on these matters in their context and have a different epistemological framework to bring to bear of which we have so much to learn from. Right? And so that is how I would answer I believe Princeton Seminary can be involved in that conversation. And that's why I want to frame convening space. And that's why I also want to start describing us in a robust way as a learning community that's learner-centered. It's not sage on the stage, you come to us, we dispense knowledge. No, we're all learners learning from one another just as we're all educators. So great question, thank you for that. So in the green right here. This is just so that all my people can try to keep up. My um, younger son just started a graduate degree, mostly online, he's got a cohort group at Penn State. And one of the things he was bubbling over with excitement about is in addition to the scholars, the professors teaching each course, they have two full-time education specialists who focus on evidence-based um, learning strategies. Mm -hmm. And they work with each professor to make sure that both their in-person, their synchronous and their asynchronous offerings are best for helping the learners learn. So I'm wondering what Princeton is doing, we have great professors, but do we have educational specialists who are using the research that's now coming out a lot about how people best learn and how materials can be presented, whether it's online or in person, to help people learn? Um, what's your name, my dear sister? Gwen. Gwen. Gwen, Gwen. Gwen, can you come to the Board of Trustees meeting with me this week? <laughs> and I'll put you as a plant in the room. I so appreciate that question. When we think about online learning, uh, so there's reasons that a lot of people are suspicious. One of the reasons suspicious is because of the prevalence of the for-profits last decade. And the for-profits that didn't think about things like learning at a com that were largely Wall Street funded, they were just trying to get investor money back, and so it was all about scale. And they took advantage of some loopholes in the law, and so particularly as it relates to federal loans, so they had egregious graduation rate and exorbitant student debt rates. That's one reason that people are suspicious of online learning. Another reason is it has to do with how most of us were introduced to online learning. It took a quarter of a century to move from zero to about 7,000 learners. Beginning in end of March, early April 2020, 22 million converted. Right. We did it fast. It was an incredible feat. But we didn't do it well. 
Let's just bracket aside the extraordinary circumstances of economic fragility, the specter of disease and death and anxiety that just, that was just not a good time for anybody. Even if we could try to bracket that, for the most part, online learning became taking what we've done in traditional classrooms, putting a Zoom camera on, and transferring it there, right? And so what was happening in the classroom, hour-long lectures, no engaging material, right? Um, it's a cooling medium. It's even worse through digital technologies. Right? And so what we're doing here to reintroduce, now I have to say, as you saw witness to, we've done this pretty well in different areas, particularly as it relates to our co-curricular pro programming. Right? Lindsay, hold up your hand. Yo, give her an applause. Give them an, give them an applause. Thank you, Lindsay. They have been incredible working with co-curricular programming to do exactly what you've talked about. But in the last month, two months, we've hired a new associate dean of online learning, Jonna Herrick Phelps. She comes with vast experience at, from an institution um, where they specialized in online learning. We have prioritized in our budget for the next fiscal year, hiring uh, online course designers, online course designers that will work with all of our curricular and co-curricular instructors. We've also hired, we're also budgeted to hire digital content producers, right? Because we know, as Bill Gates said back in 1996, content is king as it relates to this sort of space. And the more that we're able to put together to create dynamic learning modules, the greater that we are able to have success doing this. And so it's those sorts of online course designers to make sure that we have clear learning outcomes, that we make sure that they are learner-centered pedagogies, and then we'll see more testimonies like we see from your son and from Denise about how it did not uh, dilute community or bonds of affection. It actually encouraged and enriched and strengthened. So, it's our last question, and then we're going to head to lunch. I'm, I'm Dr. Charles Curtis. I pastor in Harlem. I've been a pastor there for 34 years. I've been with the church for 43 years. Uh, I'm concerned, and I'm happy about every novel program, uh, but I'm concerned uh, about the lack of courage that the church uh, shows. Uh, for example, you ask why um, the church is are smaller now. Well, when things challenge what we believe, where do we stand up and make it clear that we are really, we really believe what we've been preaching? For example, when same-sex marriage came up, I don't do it. Um, we have uh, people, efforts to amend the Bible. Um, we have crime uh, with youth problems. I have a, now two, um, not two um, projects. If you live in one project, you're fighting the other project, and they're actually killing each other, and, and, and rejoice over it. I, I'm concerned about the courage of the church to stand up, and I don't think it does that well. And I'm concerned about the lack of humanity. For one, well, I was asked one, when I was here last time, what do you think one of the great problems of, the, of our society? And I said the white church. And what I meant by that, if I'm a pastor of a black church and you're a pastor of a white church and we're in the same neighborhood, why can't we have a picnic or something to show that the humanity of each group? See, we are not really accepted as being equal to the white population. Well, I mean, I didn't go to Harvard to learn that. Um, I learned that in the streets of Jersey City. But what I'm saying to you is I'm really concerned about the church standing up and being the church. And that is a real issue for me. And I don't think that the church is doing that. So with all the learning, where's the practical side when we hit the field? That's a question. Sorry. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for your decades of service to the church. And I'll actually pick the question up where you ended in terms of the practical. 
and I'll probably just conclude with this, you know, it's, it's about the phronesis. It's what the Greeks call practical wisdom, right? And practical wisdom comes from being able to mold together multiple virtues, okay? Because according to somebody like Aristotle, what's a virtue in one context may be a vice in another context. So what somebody may refer to as courage to speak out on a topic may just be irascibility, right? Or what somebody may view as boldly proclaiming, right? Bold proclamation may just be uninformed thought, right? In the same way where somebody may it may be viewed that somebody is actually demonstrating timidity, fear. It may just be that in this particular context, they've struck the median of compassion, love, generosity, right? And so it's that sort of, when we think about education, I don't think that we approach it, this is where I agree with you, we don't approach it just from, oh, it's about how much we can take in. This kind of what Paulo Freire would describe as a banking model, just depositing in. No, I think it's once the deposit has been made, it's how we can actually live our lives in such a way and take those virtues and learn how to apply them appropriately. It's what Zora Neale Hurston referred to, being able to hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. <laughs> and so it's, it's that that we want. We want courage, but we want practical wisdom. We want compassion, we want tenderness, right? Uh, and, and I think if we do that, we're actually beginning to make some strides to be able to address some of the issues that you brought up. Listen, we've gone too long. I appreciate y'all so much. Thank you. Thank you for your attention today.